Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 25. Uh, We need to accept that having a relationship with Jesus Christ will create enemies. That is a given. And I think any Christian believer who has tried to share their faith or has lived for Christ totally gets that. They know that there is opposition to that uh, faith in Jesus Christ. The world just doesn't want it. They don't want to hear it. Uh, They've had enough of it, in fact, here in the United States. And so this morning's theme is opposition or opportunity. I I like that, that theme, opposition or opportunity. It's really about perspective, isn't it? How do you view it? Do you view it as opposition and, you know, I just keep hitting walls and and why am I going to continue to hit my head against the wall, you know, when there's other opportunities? And so we need to look for the opportunities. Yeah, you will hit opposition and there are times where you need to move on from that opposition. But there are times when you can turn that opposition around for the glory of God, that you can, through the way that you approach it, break a heart so that they're open to the gospel message, especially through the love of Christ. I'll share this story with you uh, quickly because it does work. I I don't always feel led to do this, but sometimes the Lord just leads me through the conversation and through through, uh, my uh, sharing and witnessing to someone. But I have a really close friend. I have a lot of high school friends that are on my Facebook, and I keep in contact with them. Um, And I had this opportunity to share with someone that just does not like Christianity, has a hatred for Christianity, and and you can see it by their posts and their messages to me. And there were times where we just kind of go back and forth butting heads. But there came a point when, when I saw through his writing that there's something deep inside of him that has been hurt. Someone hurt him, and it may have been God. And and so I I just kind of just threw that out there. I said, what has happened to you that has caused you to hate God so much. And boom, it just like, he melted. And he became very sincere and open. And he shared with me what it was. And so I had the opportunity then to pour into him that God isn't that way and so forth. So if we do really take the time to really approach the opposition in the right way and with love and compassion and all those things that God has given us, Sometimes we can break the heart if we really get to the core of why they're so opposed to the gospel message. And and that's my hope this morning, is that every one of us will feel free to share our faith, even with those that are opposed to it, with the opportunity that maybe we can turn it around for God's glory. Now let's keep in mind the context here. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. We saw last week that he's sending them out among wolves. This week, he's warning them in a sense that you will be opposed from this message, especially by the religious uh, sect there of their time and that persecution would be coming because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Yet for us, we can draw some principles here. Uh, I, I think that um, some of the things that are happening here will not happen with us, but there are some things that we can expect, some opposition, maybe not to the extreme that we'll see here in a minute, but there will be opposition to our relationship with Jesus Christ, and we can draw some, some great principles out of these verses here. Jesus himself will face persecution. Uh, we obviously know that. Right now he's, he's training his disciples and then once they're trained and once they see what's going on then his mission begins where they will then take him and he will be um, mocked and beaten and crucified and then buried but on the third day he resurrects from the dead which ignites the disciples to go out and preach that message he warns them of their faith and assures them that the Holy Spirit will come upon them and give them the appropriate words to speak in those times of need. Those of you that have shared your faith uh, understand that completely, where all of a sudden you're sharing and all these things just come to mind, scriptures, you know, stories, just thoughts, and, and you start sharing them, and, and in your mind you're going, where did, I, where did I get that from, you know? And it was like the Holy Spirit just giving you what you need at that very moment. I, I love the work of the Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's something that we should all be studying, the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Sometimes we get in the way and we want our work to be done. And there's a work of the Holy Spirit that, that is working and we don't know how he's working as Jesus said. You know, it's like the wind. You, know, you see the wind and it blows here and there. So, the, so is the Holy Spirit as he blows here and there and, and he works. And we just have to be sensitive to his moving. We want to sometimes get him, box him in, you know, and then understand him and know, okay, the A, B, C, D, and then that's not how he works. He just moves. Just like this morning, I just was sitting there and I just felt like, man, Lord, there's a lot of people that just need some prayer right now. They're going through life and they're struggling. And, and then the last song just confirmed it. There's just a few words in there. I thought, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. He just, you have to be ready to be moved by the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit gives you words, you need to use those words, having faith that they're words from Him. And we'll talk about that also. So let's read the text. Verse 16. <clears throat> Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your father who speaks in you now brother will deliver up brother to death and father his child and children will raise up against parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated by all for my namesake but he who endures to the end will be saved when they persecute you in this city flee to another for surely i say to you you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. We'll observe the disciples dealing with almost every resisting circumstances imaginable to the gospel. From councils to kings will resist this message. When trying to witness, you will come up against every imaginable opportunity. You'll be surprised sometimes when you share what excuses people will use. I call this the chapter of the notes and bolts of ministry or the curses and blessings of ministry, depending on your, your perspective of it. <clears throat> I look at life now, as I share the gospel, as blessings. Even the blessings of rejection and opposition reveals to me the truth of the word of God. It's interesting because as they opposed the gospel message, at the same time, they're ministering to your spirit that you are on the right track and that you're doing the right thing. It was Martin Lloyd-Jones who said, I give up nothing and I receive everything. And that is so true when we share the gospel message. We give up nothing because there's nothing of ours that we're giving up, but it's all the Lord's. And yet we receive everything. Now, when we say we receive everything, and I know, understand what he's saying here, we're not talking about material things. There are spiritual things that we need to understand are blessings to us. And again, it's about our perspective of those spiritual things. We value things differently than, than what the word tells us to value spiritually. We'll see the resisting aspects of ministry here, like they're going to be sent out among wolves, that's pretty dangerous when you think about it. Uh, will you experience wolves? Possibly some of you. I may if I go to Sudan, but I may not. Uh, we live in a day and time where, where we're pretty safe here. But if you do go to another place like Iran, and a seed was for many years, he was among wolves. He was among animals there, uh, and he was tortured. He was beaten. He looked pretty good when he came back. He was a little slen uh, slender, but but uh, looked pretty good. I'm sure that they cleaned him up very well so that they wouldn't be accused of, of beating him. They will be beaten. They will also experience imprisonment. 
Their families will turn against them. We probably have felt a certain degree of that where some of our family members have disassociated themselves with us a little bit because of our faith in Jesus Christ. They will be killed. We'll we'll see that James was killed. Uh, Many of the disciples were killed. And there will be temptation to deny the Lord. That's a serious thought that we would be tempted to deny the Lord during a hostile situation. And they will have to pick up their cross and they will have to persevere. The perseverance of the saints. When someone asked a missionary if he liked to work in Africa, he replied, do I like this work? And he said, no. My wife and I don't like dirt. We have reasonable civilized consciousness. We do not like crawling in the vile huts through the goat's waste. We do not like association with ignorant, filthy, savage people. But is a man to do nothing for Christ? He does not like. God pity him if not. Liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go and we go because love constrains us. Sometimes that is, that is the attitude that we need to have. We may not like the work, but it is the work and we go because God has called us to go. <clears throat> we were here all day yesterday. The guys left. I was here alone waiting for another brother to come and bring some electrical uh, equipment uh, here that he was going to work on the, on, the, on the unit. But I got tired. I was ready to go home at 12, and it's 4. And then I'm just thinking, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. And so I thought, I'll just text him real quick. I don't know if you're coming or not, but I'm leaving. Give me a call. If, if you get there, I'll come back. <sighs> Drive all the way. Pull up in my driveway. Beep, 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 beep. I'm here. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Okay, get back into my car and drive all the way back here. You know, I don't like doing that. None of us like doing that. Some of us don't even like picking up the trash or our clothes from our bedroom floor because, oh, that's so hard to do. But it's the attitude, right, that we have because it's work. We get that attitude. No, there's work to be done, and we may not like it, but we got to get it done. And so when God calls us to share the gospel, it's not an easy thing to do. We may not like to do it, but we should do it anyway because he wants us to there are also blessings there are also blessings of sharing our faith with others now those blessings are not what you think though we need to really understand they're not what you think god isn't going to reward you with some financial increase your stock options aren't going to plunder, you know plunder but they're going to go up that's not how he rewards you he rewards you with the opportunities that you get to see while you're sharing or the opportunity that you get to see when a life does surrender themselves to Christ and you watch them grow in the Lord those are the things that blesses us as Christians uh, one they are to apply the wisdom of God that actually is a blessing because there was a time when we walked with God without wisdom. The fact that God would give us wisdom is, is a blessing. That God would actually give us wisdom and enough of that wisdom to be able to give it to somebody and they respond to it. Wow, what a blessing that is. It, it, it is a blessing to be used of God in that manner. Two, they are to depend on the Holy Spirit for comfort and words to speak with. That's, that is definitely a blessing knowing that, <clears throat> that what you're doing is, is biblical and you're doing it out of love and the Holy Spirit comforts you through that. I'm right where God wants me. You know, going to Sudan, I, I called a friend of mine who's a millionaire and I wanted his support. <clears throat> and so I, I shared with him, I said, hey, I have something to ask of you. Uh, I want you to support me. Uh, I'm going to uh, Sudan. And he just stopped. I, I was like, are you still there? And he said, um, I don't think that's God telling you to go to Sudan. And I'm like, okay. I go, I, no, I totally understand. If you don't want to support me, that that's fine, you know. He goes, no, 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 stop. I think that you're not hearing God. I think that you should not be going over there risking your, and he started just going, and I can see him getting emotional and it touched me because he loved me to tell me don't go you know he was he was adamant you better not go you know let someone else go who's called to do that you're called to 
be here and teach at your church and minister to those people you're not called to go to some place that you may get into trouble you know and I'm just like wow I didn't realize how much this guy loved me though he's not going to support me probably but he loved me and he loved me And, and it was comforting to know that he loved me it was not comforting to know, and I didn't take it that way, that God was saying, don't go, because I have the total peace of the Holy Spirit telling me to go. In fact, I'm getting so many negative uh, responses from people, and I'm not saying from the church, but from pastors, saying, oh, no, no, you shouldn't go, you're too old, you know. Uh, you shouldn't go, it's a dangerous place. You know, I'm getting this from a lot of ministers, but God, through the Holy Spirit, has just given me such a peace over it that I have to listen to the Holy Spirit more than I listen to anyone else. And here's the thing. It could be that if a man can discourage you, then you shouldn't be going. But if man can't discourage you and, and you are adamant and determined to go, then maybe God wants you to go. Am I going to like it there? I have no idea. From what they all describe, probably not, <laughs> you know, probably not, because it's dirt and worms and dysentery. All those shots are to keep me from getting that stuff, but they're telling me you're going to get it anyway. So um, probably not, but I'm going to love pouring the word of God into these guys' hearts. An opportunity, and from what I understand too, the guy that's supposed to go with me may not go, so I may be teaching from morning till night for two whole weeks. The book of Job, uh, Philemon, Philemon, and Jude. So that's a lot of teaching. That's a lot of pouring into, and I love doing that. I love teaching the Word of God, and so I've got to do with the Holy Spirit. And to be able to say, wow, the Spirit moved me, that, that to me is a blessing. Uh, they will be saved if they endure to the end, definitely a blessing. They will realize that if they uh, persecuted Jesus, that they will be persecuted, and so that's a blessing, knowing that we're just like our Master. They're not to fear what happens to their bodies uh, they will be transformed in the new heaven and so there should be no fear of, of what they can do to our bodies uh, they will they are worth more than just animals they have value in the eyes of god that's a blessing to know that god loves you god cares about you there are rewards for preaching the gospel when we get to heaven the rewards will be there and and some loved brothers or sisters will receive them and their message and that's always a blessing to see someone come to know the lord jesus christ so so jesus says behold and he says this emphatically i behold i am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves luke says as lambs little tender lambs defenseless little lambs who don't know how to defend themselves whatsoever because lambs have no defense system whatsoever they don't have sharp teeth. They don't have horns. They don't know how to buck. They just know how to, man, that's it. Eat me up. I mean, they're totally defenseless. And Jesus says, I am sending you out there. Well, wow. But I've got nothing to defend. I, I'm sending you out there. And if I'm sending you out there, I'm also protecting you. I'm also giving you what you need. And so you don't have to fear as a little lamb who will be in the middle of, in the, in the midst of these dangerous situations as he speaks to the disciples. Matthew's emphasis here is, is on the commitment and vulnerability here which characterizes these disciples. In these next verses, he's really looking at the heart of the disciples and what their character will be and how their character will be built up through this situation that's going to definitely make them vulnerable. And there is no doubt that these disciples of Jesus will be in the midst of trouble. And we see it as we read in, through the book of Acts. And there is no doubt that you, if you share your faith, that you will get opposition. But that is to be expected. Therefore, he says, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The word wise is prudent. Uh, we can all have knowledge. Uh, you might be a reader love books and have all these wonderful books that you have read and and you can mark them off you know and and proudly say i've read that book i've read that book and oh and i've read that book over there you can have all this knowledge and situation but you can still be unwise because prudence is knowledge applied that's what wisdom is when you learn how to apply the knowledge that you have it becomes wisdom 
If you know that you're not supposed to go in one direction because there may be a pit there, that's the knowledge that you need. But if you keep walking and you fall in it, you didn't really use that knowledge. That's pretty stupid. But when you walk around it, then you go, that's a wise man. He applied the knowledge that he had to his life. And so we need to be wise, Jesus said, as serpents and harmless as doves here. Now he's talking about the, the wisdom of a snake and the wisdom of a dove. He's not talking about a negative sense of this serpent, you know, that they're attackers or they're, you know, uh, got poison in there. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that snakes who wait patiently behind the bush or under a rock for their prey, and they'll wait there for hours. And, and when that prey finally comes close enough, boom, they eat their prey. So possibly it is the patience of a dove. Be patient, persevere, be gentle as a dove. These are characteristics that we should have as believers. Philippians 2.15 says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as light in the world. God wants us to be wise as serpents and doves so that we are blameless and harmless children of God. Careful that you don't browbeat someone with the word of God but that you do it with love and with compassion understanding that their eyes are blinded and they don't understand the gospel message and there might even be some deep pain in their lives that was caused by a father figure maybe you know a, an abusive father to a child scars them for life that their view of God, who supposedly is a man, can be distorted because they have a father who's supposed to love him. And now I'm supposed to believe this God is supposed to love me and my life is in shambles and he's not helping me. You've got to deal with those things in order to get to the heart. So we need to be very careful. Oh, I know it's easy to, oh, but they need the gospel and they need to repent and then God will take care. I know that. We all know that. But let's, let's approach it with, with love and compassion. Harmless children of God without fault in the midst of crooked and perverse generation. Definitely crooked and perverse, but it, they need Jesus. The disciples were to be wise, cautious, and aware while maintaining the blameless and integrity of the gospel message. <clears throat> Therefore, or but Jesus says in verse 17, beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils to scourge you in their synagogues. So he's speaking of the men. In the Greek, it really should be the men. Beware of the men. Well, who's the men? Who are the men that the disciples will be dealing with the most? It is the religious sect, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sauls who are sent out from the councils to deliver up Christians. Uh, this is a picture that Jesus gives that is just very straightforward. It's, it's not doves, it's not wolves, it's not lambs. He gives you a little picture there, but now he gets straightforward. Look, men will deliver you to councils and you will be scourged in the synagogues. The synagogues were the places where they were to come and worship God, where they opened up the Torah and they read the scriptures of the Lord. But it was also a place of, of a local judicial system. And you would bring your cases there and then they would judge as a Jewish community those situations and they would sentence you. And if you needed to be flogged, they would tie you around a pole or something and they would flog you with a whip. And according to Deuteronomy, it was 40 stripes. Well, they changed it to 39 because they felt 40 was too brutal. <laughs> One less, just as brutal. But they would deliver you up to these councils. And it's interesting here that the Jewish Sanhedrin were the supreme council of the nation. Uh, their subordinates to them were the smaller tribunal cities. In the times of Christ, the function of the Sanhedrin councils were limited by the Roman government. They couldn't do everything like sentence someone to death, but they could flog you if necessary. Uh, the disciplinary officer would administrate the uh, punitive floggings upon you depending on the council. And this involved whipping, beating, and usually done with the victim tied up. And it was administered by some servant of the religious group. It was the same type of beating that Jesus received before his crucifixion 
there on the cross. Often the victims would die from the beating depending upon what kind of whip uh, they would use with metal objects or glass or even clay. There were usually three judges that were overseeing this and the three judges were, were men that would read the scriptures. The second would probably count the strokes and then the third was the one that would command each one to be, be taken. It was the Apostle Paul who speaking to Jesus in a trance tells us that he would go to every synagogue and he would imprison and beat those believers. And so he was one of those that went out and did this to Christian believers. And the Lord got a hold of his heart that later on down the road, it was Paul himself who had received five beatings there in 2 Corinthians 11. Interesting how his life flip-flopped the other way around. And so those who disliked the disciples, who were opposed to the message, were dragged into the synagogues, and they were judged legally, and they were beaten before the people. Does this happen today? Well, of course it does. We, saw, we, we just saw the news with the seed who has been imprisoned and uh, the reports of him being beaten while in prison and, and denied food and health care and, and so forth. Uh, it happens today and it's happening more brutally, I think, as far as the beatings today than ever before. And it's not just with adults, but it's with children. And that's what just is so disgusting and so heart moving when you hear and if you're one, and I don't encourage you this, and I say this very carefully as you look at videos and so forth, you will see children being decapitated or crushed by these wicked men who oppose the gospel message. A seed went, went to, to prison by Iran because he was accused of, for proselytizing, for sharing his faith. Yet he was very careful when he was in Iran to be a English teacher there. And only to those who inquired of his faith, he would share with them. But yet he was accused of because they knew that that was really his purpose for being there. So they falsely accused him and imprisoned him. At one point, they, they, they were going to let him go, but then they brought him back uh, to prison. So this is still happening today. And um, I think worse than ever before, which is a sign of the end time. So Jesus says, beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils. And if you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So he's also speaking future. He may be speaking here about um, the Apostle Paul, who literally went before Rome there, um, before the Gentiles and before kings and so forth. Uh, Later, we're going to see James being brought before Herod and a sword being thrusted before him. So they definitely are going to be brought before kings and governors. You and I may not necessarily be brought before them. Um, it depends on our activities, I guess, here in this world and what will really take place in our own lives. You and I struggle with just our neighbors and the opportunity that we might have to sit down with them with a cup of coffee and just share with them, you know, what Jesus has done in your life or just inviting them to church and them possibly getting up and saying, what kind of neighbor are you to bring me here to tell me that? You know, that's probably the worst that some of us uh, will get, but it's worth it to at least make our, our line drawn so that they understand who we are and what we represent and what we stand for. And so we need to do that, guys. This church needs to be active in sharing its faith, not just on a Saturday morning evangelizing, but every day inviting. When was the last time you invited someone to church? If every one of us, if this church, we have 150 people in this church. Not everybody comes to church. Only 100 come to church. And every week it's different because some will miss, the other ones will come. And it's just like a hit and miss thing. But if we, every one of us invited one person, one person, 150 people, one person, we would have 300 just that quick and we'd have 300 people that we can pour into and equip for the work of the ministry and we can reach the loss even more because of the resources that God could bring in through these people we need to be active and we need to not fear what men would say to us personally Jesus goes on and says but when they deliver you up and that's an indication of a matter of fact 
when they deliver you up. That's not a possibility, but a probability. And there is a high possibility that, that you and I will not be delivered up to anyone in reality, as I said earlier. But he said, don't worry about how or what you should speak. The number one fear of everyone is what? Speaking in public, right? How, how many of you fear speaking in a crowd? Just kind of raise your, raise your hand. Look at Gabby raises her hand right away. I don't, how, oh, so some of you like speaking in crowds. Oh, let me note that down there. <laughs> a lot of us fear that. I know I feared it for the longest time uh, when I was younger because I was stupid. <laughs> All right, I, let me take that back. I was not educated. Um, I, I didn't have the knowledge, and so when I did say something, <laughs> it didn't make any sense, and so they laugh at me and mock me. So when you get mocked enough and laughed at enough, you learn to just be quiet. And that's me. I was a shy one. I didn't say anything. You'd find me in the corner sitting with the guys laughing with them, but I'd never say anything. And so it took me a long time before I could even get up and, and say anything. And for even years, just an insight, uh, even for years, you would see me teach like this because I was so worried I'd say the wrong thing. I'd I, I would just stick to my words and never vary off. And so I'd make sure that everything I wrote, I said because I knew it was right, because I studied it. And if I went off, I thought, I might have said something wrong or, or, or unscriptural, you know, but it was really difficult for me. Now I'm just like, Lord, lead me. If I say something wrong, then they'll come up and they'll say, that was wrong, you're right. You know, forgive me, you're right. And that's, that's the truth. I don't have a problem saying that. <clears throat> Public speaking is hard to do. And Jesus is saying, don't worry about what you're going to speak. And when I remember reading this, I'm like, no, that's kind of, I'm going to get ready. I, I need to get ready. I need to read my word. I need to study commentaries. I need to listen to messages. Because when that day comes, and if I don't have my Bible with me, and I don't have my devices with me, I got to have something in me to be able to speak it. And so I want to be ready for that. Because the Holy Spirit can't bring anything that's not there. So we really need to be in our word and we really need to be studying the word of God. The two-year Bible plan is wonderful, but go beyond that. You should be listening to the messages, re-listen to it online or, or listen to K-Wave all day long and, and get taught through that. That means, but we need to fill ourselves with the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can bring it up in those times of need. For it is not you, and that's an emphatic. Jesus is saying, it's not you. Make that clear. You have no ability whatsoever to speak the truth. None of us do. But it's the spirit of your father who speaks in you. We need to depend on the father and the Holy Spirit more than anything else. I won't go down that road. Jesus speaks six times about the Holy... I'm sorry, Matthew speaks six times about the Holy Spirit. And every time he mentions the Holy Spirit, it's always in reference to Jesus Christ. There's one time, and it's at the baptism of Christ, where Christ says there will come one that will baptize you with water and fire, and that is the Holy Spirit. And that's the Holy Spirit that the disciples have to go in the upper room and wait for, and that changes their whole life. It gives them such boldness and strength that they go out and preach the gospel. I encourage you to get Chuck's book. I, I, be, I believe it's uh, Living Water that's about the Holy Spirit. Right, Roman? Yeah. It's a great book. Um, there's some neat things in there. I've read it. I read most of all Chuck's books. Um, there's a story in there of how he got filled in the basement and began to just be filled and, and moved emotionally. It was the same type of experience that I had, and it was confirmation for me that the Holy Spirit just filled me in such a beautiful way. And it's one that we should all be filled with the Holy Spirit and not fear what men would say. We need those daily devotionals. But, but now, brother, in verse 21, now brother will deliver a brother to death and a father his child and children will raise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Now, in the context here, um, it, it's in the sense that is causative. Um, they will be the reason for their imprisonment and their death. That is their children and their parents and those that are in opposition. 
Mark says in 13, 12, brother will betray brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. This verse indicates that Jesus' message will definitely affect our families. We will have opposition to non-believing relatives. They will not like the message that Jesus has entrusted to us to give. And it's the same as in the Old Testament too. Micah 7, 6 says, For son dishonors father, daughter raises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy are the, are the men of his own household. Isn't that interesting? These, these relatives who don't believe will use the legal system to come against us. That happened with Germany, right? Hitler got tired of the fact that he couldn't raise up young strong men so he took the children away from the parents and put him in their school and he taught them to be strong he indoctrinated them we see that happening today in our universities where they're indoctrinating them with liberal concepts that's why i'm leery about sending uh, our kids to uh, college we need to be very careful that our kids are trained before they go there almost 90 percent if not more Christian kids who go to universities, secular universities, they leave those places not believing in God because they are trained to indoctrinate the kids not to believe in God. So they have to be very strong in their faith. Uh, all of my children uh, pretty much are self-taught in what they are doing today. I have one child who was a genius, I think, of, of all of us, just smart kid, always got A's, Really didn't have to study. He's just always been that way. He's got the bless him, bless him genes, I think. Uh, went to uh, Cal Poly University. And I'm not saying my other kids are dumb, okay? Don't take it that way because they're very smart. I think it's harder for someone to be self-taught because that takes discipline and work and, and, and so forth. So, okay, back to the other. Here's my point. <laughs> when he was in the university, they tried their hardest to convince him there was no God. That was just a constant uh, poking at his faith. And when he was all done, graduated with his um, BS, I believe it was, he came to Virginia and I and said, thanks, because if you had not poured into us all that you did, I wouldn't be believing in Jesus anymore. They're geared to do that, and we see that today uh, completely. Jesus said, look, now, <clears throat> the place where you look for love, where you hope for loyalty from the family, is a place where you're going to find opposition. And it's probably one of the hardest things to go through as parents and I'm sure as children to find those that you have grown up with and have experienced life <clears throat> fail to receive the truth of the gospel message. So when someone comes to me and their marital situation is difficult. I totally get it on both sides, the ones that are hurting and the ones that are not maybe even at fault. I totally get the, the, the whole sense and feeling of loving and loyalty and commitment, and yet it's not there. Jesus said, your own family, your own family will turn you over to the courts and even to death. Satan would love nothing better than to do is to hurt and cause division in families. As a matter of fact, to just cause a division between God's creation and him himself. It happened in the past and it will happen again. Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 1 talks about the last days. And this is one of the signs. He says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, 
lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, that's religion, but denying the power. And from such people, Paul says, turn away from them. Hitler said this, the weak must be chiseled away. I want young men and women who can suffer pain. A young German must be as swift as a greyhound and as tough as leather and as hard as steel. That's the world. <clears throat> and they're gearing up to oppose Christianity. The signs are here, and Jesus is right on when he says that. Verse 22, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Not because of you, but because of Jesus Christ. And, and let it be because of Jesus Christ, because you are following biblical principles, and not be because uh, you're not adhering to the scriptures, and you're doing something more out of the work of the flesh than of God. And when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through these cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes again. Now, he's not saying that these disciples uh, will go out and they will not complete their task before Jesus comes back again because obviously he's gone, he's in heaven, the second coming is not in the future. He's talking about this immediate situation and he's talking about his death and resurrection, that first appearance there um, when he will come to them and then they will go to the upper room and then go out to all the cities there. It is a difficult passage to understand here. That is my interpretation. I've read all the probably about seven or eight commentaries on it and they all had different views some of them thought that it's 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 a prophecy of the tribulation period that he may be talking about not necessarily the disciples but the people there going into the cities before Jesus' second coming they won't be able to do it all so um, hard passage to understand but you will definitely be persecuted and when you're persecuted just move away you know don't spend too much time there there's something to be said about you know putting your face before someone that just continues to oppose you there's a time where you just say that's it i'm done i need to move on because i got better things to do and there are people that need to hear it and i'm wasting my time with them you know in a sense that's something by the way that you should really really pray about don't just do it because you're mad right you just can't oh that's it I'm mad at them. I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I have biblical grounds. No, pray about it though because God still wants you to live before them in the light. A disciple is not above his teacher. Now what he's saying here, nor a servant above his master, what he's saying is, look, if they're going to persecute me as your master and teacher, they're going to persecute you. You're not above me. None of us are above Jesus. And none of us are above the leadership that God has given us in this uh, Christian nation of ours, and I'm talking about Christian leaders. If, if they persecute our missionaries, if they persecute our leadership, then they're going to persecute us also. We're not gonna get away from this persecution. It is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. I mean, you can be like them. Uh, we need to understand that, that principle. When you are a disciple, when, when you are a servant, you are fulfilling a specific role. That's your role. You are a disciple. In a sense, you're all my disciples. You come here to be equipped with the work of the ministry. And I am pouring into you the word as I teach it. And so you are my disciples. You can become as well informed as I am. There might even be a time that you may grow beyond that and God may use you in a wonderful uh, work and you become now the teacher and have disciples, but you can only be as equal to that disciple or to that teacher because you are a disciple and you are a servant to your master. So don't think that you're gonna get away with anything because you're smarter, because uh, you're more dedicated, because you know more. That's not the case. In fact, Jesus said, if they call the master of the house Beelzebub, which was a Canaanite deity, it was an idol. 
uh, that was associated with demonic forces. And so they were calling Jesus names. Oh, you're of Beelzebub. So he says, if they call your master words, how much more will they call those of the household? So they're going to call you names. You know, you're, you're a right-wing conservative. You know, you're, you're a Jesus freak. You know, you're one of those uh, people that are just way out there in Christianity to the extreme that we are calling you terrorists in a sense. I've heard that word, and you've heard all the different words that, that you're called because of your association with Jesus Christ. So if they called him names, they'll call you names too. Now, is it not true that if you are acting and walking your life out with Christ, that these things will happen? But if you are not, and if you are a lukewarm Christian, then obviously they're not going to call you names because you're just like them. There's no difference between you and them. So it's for those Christians that are living their Christianity. If you're not living your Christianity, then something's wrong with your Christianity. Your view of Christianity is not the biblical view because Jesus said, you will suffer these things and if i suffer them you will too because you're not greater and the only way you can get around that is by compromising it's not worth it don't compromise i saw a video <clears throat> on the rapture it was a spanish video so i totally didn't understand anything that was said but i understood the message because th the video was all about churches and, and the video is showing churches and all of a sudden the rapture takes place, the clothes are laid there and people are jumping up and down. They're coming to the altar, they're praying because they realize we just got left behind. Could be the compromised Christians. Are all going to be raptured up? Good question. I struggle with that one. I've done some research on that one. I even asked Pastor Chuck personally, what do you think? You know what his answer was? There are some scriptures that you could take as, as some being left behind because they have been compromising. I'm like, ooh, that just changes a lot, doesn't it? So we need to be right with the Lord. Three things. We need to accept that having a relationship with Jesus Christ will bring opposition. We will have enemies. Opposition, though, will bring opportunity to shine brightly in a hostile world. Turn it around for God's glory. Understand that you'll get that opposition, but you can take that opportunity to get to the heart of that person. Why are you so against it? What has happened in your life? And when you find that out, you're able to pour into them the truth. And then thirdly, study the word of God. Prepare. Prepare to be persecuted. Prepare to have answers. Ask yourself questions and see if you have the answers and just study so that when that time comes, when God puts you in a situation at work, and they all of a sudden mock you, the Holy Spirit will give you a answer to that mocking of love and grace, but one that will pierce their hearts. So study to show yourselves approved.